So the garden's basically in now, and this is our first year gardening in this particular plot. And so whenever you start a new system, you're inevitably gonna see things and observe patterns. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the patterns that we've observed thus far. Um, this garden had been rototilled probably for 20 plus years. Um, and so it, it really is starting to look like a gray wooded soil. If you take a peek at this, um, it's like the perfect mix of say, sand, clay, and silt, like a gardener's dream, but the amount of organic matter in it is really pretty piss poor actually. And so one of the things that happens when you rototill a garden is you're basically vitamixing it. You're turning it over, you're hitting it with sharp blades and you kill worms and you kill microbes. You blend it all up together, which gives you a good tilth for a little while to plant your seeds in, but then it starts to crust kind of like this. You see all these crusts are forming? I'm not sure if you can see there in my hand. And you get these cracks. Um, and that's a really good sign that there's a lack of organic matter in the soil as a result of a lot of rototilling. Now, I'm not against rototilling. I think rototilling can be a really great disturbance tool, but when used uh, too much, it can end up creating a lot of damage. Now, um, as a result of the lack of rototilling, we're probably gonna see a pretty low level of productivity in this garden for a couple of years. And one of the things that kind of early indicators, actually I'll go over to this row here, is how our corn is looking. So take a look at the, the corn down here. Now corn is a pretty big nitrogen feeder. And when you see leaves like this, that are really kind of more of a yellow than a green, it's a really strong indication that we have a nitrogen deficiency. Now you'll notice we've planted clover in here, which is a nitrogen fixer. Um, to try and re remedy that. And I think we've got to put a bit more clover in here in order to have any main major um, improvement on the soil. But this to me is telling me that, that we're lacking um, the microbes that make nitrogen plant available. And likely the way that nitrogen would have been made available in this garden in the past was through rototilling. Because when you rototill and you kill worms and you kill microbes, microbes and worms and these types of organisms are just sacks of fertilizer and so when you splat them against a blade like a rototiller blade you're making those available for the plant roots but it's not sustainable it can't last for long and so what we have to do now is we've got to add some nitrogen in and the nitrogen in this case is going to come from some of that dehydrated food that we got from eco growth um, you could also use uh, grass clippings. Grass clippings are really high in nitrogen. Not too much though. You can really overdo it with grass clippings. Um, and then we're going to deeply mulch it and continue to cover crop it. Now just to kind of have a comparison with that soil, let's go into one of our forests over here. Now because our ecosystem gets so much rain, we have to be really cautious with how we manage our soils here because, actually I'll go to this forest over here, see what I can find. Because um, rain, while it is really important for plant growth, can actually leach soils. And so if you have too much rain and you don't have enough coverage, it will leach soils. And so the way nature has kind of accommodated this issue is that when water in an ecosystem exceeds about 15 inches per year, or about 400 millimeters, you end up with forests or said a different way, you end up with perennial systems. And that's certainly what this ecosystem's all about. It's about growing perennial systems. So that doesn't mean we're not gonna have gardens. It just means that we're gonna have to do extra work to make sure that we keep cover on those gardens so that we end up with good looking soils. Now we're entering into one of these perennial systems, a forest ecology, and I haven't pre-dug this, so I don't know what we're gonna find here. But we're gonna just walk in just a little bit and we're gonna look down to the canopy and see if the soils look as poor over here in these perennial systems. So let's take a peek. So right away we see mulch, a mulch layer. So we got lots of leaves from last year, lots of moisture in there. Oh yeah, look at that. Totally different crumb structure down there. So if we get right in there, it's a dark, rich soil. It's not compacted. Look at all the aggregates in there, all the clumps and 
They're called clods in soil science. A little bit of wood there. A totally different soil than what we have in the garden. And so, <laughs> whenever we do a consultancy, we always do this. We try and find the worst soil on the property and we try and find the best soil on the property. And so on this property, the worst soil is in the garden that was garden for 25 years. The best soil is in the forest that never got touched. And so right there, that's a great example of a permaculture pattern. So what can we learn from this pattern that will give us clues about how to manage our gardens so that we have nutrient dense food and drought resilience and healthy plants. And so the message I take is we need diversity, we need soil coverage, um, where possible we need to grow perennial plants so that's why we're going to do forest gardens. Um, we probably want to grow annuals and biennials together if that's possible so we'll have to do some thinking about that. There's no tillage going on over there or at least very minimal like we will introduce pigs and other animals in there to kind of till the soil a little bit but it's not going to be something that the animals or the pigs stay in there all the time forever that would cause damage. Um, so in every permaculture property we have a zone 5 and you could kind of say that at least my experience has been that when we go onto properties and we look for the best soil it's almost always in zone 5 and so we can go out into that zone 5 and learn or at least observe why are those soils so much different than the soils in our zone 1 or zone 2. Now just because we have a garden doesn't mean we have to have bad soil. And so as we build this topsoil, we're gonna share our secrets and our learnings and our failures as well. And uh, from there, hopefully you guys can come along with us. So I'm gonna get back to my corn. I'm gonna put some of that nutrient on there and then we're gonna mulch it. And we'll see if we see any major changes in the, in the coming days. And looks like there's a rain coming up there. Nice big one. So I'm gonna see if I can get that on there before the rains come. Okay, see you guys in the next video. So I got the beds all mulched and it just occurred to me that I probably didn't tell you what the eco growth nutrient is. So I better just explain that. I did explain it in another video, um, but I'll just explain it again in case you didn't watch that. So um, this is it right here. It's a bit of an experiment that I'm doing and you've probably seen the eco growth movies and if you haven't, I'll put a link to it in the um, cards above. Um, basically, EcoGrowth is a company that I've been interviewing. I've made a couple of videos about them already. And they, uh, they started off as an industrial laundry. And they started uh, coming up with ecological ways to clean mats in buildings as well as uniforms and everything else. So as a result of going and collecting all these mats, they decided to start collecting the food waste as well. And in addition to cleaning mats, they also supply all of the paper napkins and so they've helped companies set up uh, diversion programs for the paper napkins um, or towels for washing hands after you go to the washroom and so they ended up with all this organic waste and they run it through their food dehydrator which ultimately I mean if it's possible to compost that is a better solution but composting is not always possible depending on where you are and so their solution has been to dry it down and then either burn it and I said well Glenn you know if you're um, if you're going to be going to the trouble of collecting all this stuff and drying it out, let's try and feed it back to the soil because basically it's just pure dried food, which is essentially nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So what I did is I put some of that stuff down on the garden bed and then uh, I followed it up with some straw mulch. So here's the straw mulch. I'll just show you guys. And so we still have those same kind of yellowy sickly looking corn and uh, we'll see how long it takes for them to pop back. You can see the rest of our garden is mulched now as well pretty much. There's a few beds that aren't and we'll get to that eventually. Um, and we'll see how fast that works. Now some of you might be wondering why mulch is such a, a valuable um, amendment to the, to the garden and it's got lots of functions. So number one, there's some nutrition in the mulch itself. It's, it's pretty carbaceous typically. So straw is I think 100 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. But um, while plants like heat, the roots of the plants don't like the heat. 
And so if it's 25, 30 degrees Celsius outside in the summertime, that means a brown, dark soil can get up to 40 to 50 degrees Celsius, which means that any water that's in that soil is going to basically evaporate off the soil. So the mulch reduces the evaporation and cools the soil down. Now the other thing that it does is it shades out the light. And it means that the soil itself doesn't have any of that intense UV radiation, which means that all the little bugs and microbes and worms can actually work under the mulch where normally they would have to be under one or two inches of soil. And that means that they can start moving material up and down in the soil column, <clears throat> which is going to help improve the uh, nutrition of the plants. Uh, it's going to work that soil. It's going to put worm poop up there. Uh, it's going to put bug poop up there. And uh, really they are the hardest workers in the garden. And so we've got to create shelter for them. And if we don't, uh, we do so at our own detriment because we're basically having to replace the work that they get to do for basically for free. Um, and so mulch helps to do all of those things. Now, the one time that mulch can be detrimental is uh, <clears throat> when you've got a really wet spring. And so sometimes mulch can actually encourage incredible slug growth. So if you're mulching your garden and you start getting lots of slugs in your garden, it means that you actually have to rake the mulch back, let the soil dry out, which will then kill off some of those slug eggs. Uh, and then when things start to dry off again later in the summer, you can then go and put the mulch back uh, without risk of having slugs. So I think that pretty much covers it for today. Uh, we'll be keeping you guys up to date with regards to that eco growth material and and how the, um, uh, the, the mulch works on the beds and if these corns recover or not. Um, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave them in the show notes below. Sorry, leave them in the comment section below. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Okay, talk soon.